book that meant so much. Uh, John Carroll, the story that John shared about Dorothea Patterson uh, and being a book, and that was James James, of course, who was the author. James is responsible for making up a bunch of lies. It's just it's amazing what happens. I, I talked in my workshop, someone said, how do you get people moving forward in this stuff? And I said, you have to catch a vision. Vision drives everything. And then they said, well, how do you get your vision? I said, if you do people, if you do you see somebody and you go, that's what James Claiborne does. Uh, he's, a, he's a gifted person. He went to Eastern Seminary. Um, his friend is Eastern College at the University of Prison Seminary. Um, he runs the Simple Way. But um, his books are very profound. But again, what we always say is it's authentic. It comes out of his life. And I am so excited to turn this thing over to James and let him tell his story. Let's welcome him. James Claiborne. So delighted to be here, and I got to travel with one of my closest friends. You know, he, he was my Greek teacher originally, Scott Hall, and I read all of his books. And then I read, you know, Richard Foster and all this, and now we're all learning from each other. It's just incredible. It's a gift to be here. And I think what I love about this community here is uh, it's been my heart to, to talk about formation because I think it's one of the most endangered arts in the church that we we've, we've been so good at making believers, but not as good at forming disciples. And yet I'm convinced that our gospel doesn't just spread uh, by force, but by fascination. You know, not just with our doctrinal statements, but with communities that fascinate the world with God's love. So that's what I've been preaching everywhere. Uh, and I, I, um, I think we, we've got a dilemma on our hands because our Christianity has become less and less fascinating to many people. You know, we, 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 we uh, a few years ago, I hope things are better now, but a few years ago, you know, that Barna study showed that the number one perception of Christians from non Christians was that we're anti gay, anti homosexual. Number two was that we're judgmental, and number three that was that we're hypocritical. You know, that, that the list wasn't very beautiful of what people said when they heard Christian. What didn't make the list was love. So I think what's exciting is we need to form people into Christians that look like Jesus again, right? That leave off, as Mother Teresa said, the fragrance of Christ in the world. And sometimes we smell like other stuff. So I, I think that aroma of Jesus is what we're meant to leave off. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's why they're preaching away. I feel like that's preaching the choir here. So I felt very moved to do something a little different that, uh, to look at a text that might be uh, really familiar to us. If it's not, then this will be great. It's a wonderful story. If it's one of those stories, the Good Samaritan story, one of those is like, God, so I've heard that many times. Can I, I want to ask you just not to get in peace and so, but just do this, just shake it off a little bit. You know, and like, hear it with fresh ears in a second. Uh, but I'm going to pray for it. Um, when I travel, I travel with a couple of things in my pocket um, and that help me pray. One of them is a rosary, which uh, I use to be able to concentrate. Um, uh, the, the, some of the prayers, the Hail Mary and some of the things, they're, they're, they're not so exactly so like natural prayers to me, but what does so naturally is to hold on to something that reminds me, I'll pray the fruits of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, I pray through the Beatitudes, so I use it to pray. But also in my pocket, I carry the shell of a bullet that I found on my block. And it's just increasingly tricky to get it through uh, security at the airport. But um, I, I, um, I hold those together because they help me to pray and they help me to remember uh, that even as we uh, lift our prayers up to God, we've got to keep our feet on the ground. Right? That we've got to keep ourselves connected to the brokenness of the world. So I pick that up off my street and I carry it with me. So as we pray, I want to invite you to to pray with me and also to think as I think with a very heavy heart about what happened in Ferguson and, and the gathering that's happening as we speak right now with tens of thousands of folks to gather there for nonviolent and things and protests. And we think of the brokenness of our world, but lift all that up to God and pray now, O Lord, uh, give us ears to hear and eyes to see the things you want us to. Help us to uh, more and more like Jesus. Amen. 
make us attentive to the world that we live in. And Jesus came and won. So now we get to we, we get to read the story, and uh, uh, I'm going to read it to us, and then we'll, we'll look at it. So Luke chapter 10 says this: Jesus replied, "A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I don't have it memorized." Anyway, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, but when he saw the injured man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came up to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling came to where the injured man was, and when he saw him, he went up to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever else you spend, I will repay you when I come back this way. Which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law said, The one who showed mercy to him. But Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. As we look at that story with fresh eyes, there's a, a few things that have caught my attention. And, uh, as we look at the characters, I don't know what you notice, but if, as we think about the man who was beaten up, what do we know about him? Not much. Right? In fact, scholars say that the very two things that you could use to identify someone are ripped off of them, and that is language or dialect, accent, and clothing. And so he's not out unconscious, he's stripped of his clothing, so the very things that we might use to say, this person is from here or there, or this is their religion, or this is their geography, that's ripped off. So all we know is that they are a human being made in the image of God. Amen? They are invaluable. So we don't know uh, exactly what language they spoke, or where they were from, or what religion they had, or even what their sexual identity is, we know that they are a child of God made in the image of God, and they matter to God. And let's just look at the religious folks. I mean, this is a scandalous story. You know, so sometimes we read these, we're like, oh, what a great story. You're like, I think this guy, Jesus, is simple. You know, I don't do like, oh, you know what you did? You know, and so the religious folks come by, and, and they do nothing. They cross to the other side, and we don't know exactly why they do that. They might have been scared. I mean, legitimately, they might have been thinking, where, where are those robbers might still be around? You know, like, uh, they, they, they might have been uh, too hurried. They might have been rushed on their way to a trusty meeting or something. Look, look at them. You know, one of my friends said, if the devil can't steal your soul, then he'll just keep you busy with church work. Uh, so I think a lot of our church work is good, but sometimes we can be religious in all of the stuff that we fill our lives with. From the very heart of the gospel, which calls us to be and to do nothing. And you're the Samaritan. The Samaritan, you know, I don't know if you guys know y'all too much about Samaritans, but uh, the, the absolutely social outcast, ostracized, shunned group, you know, and it was part ethnic, part theological, right, that they had these differences, that they were, were very much the shunned people, and so, uh, and, and really the Samaritan may not have believed all the right stuff, so he might not have had the theology, but he had the compassion, and, and, and so he, he's moved to do something, and he reaches in to the ditch and lifts his neighbor out, and he loves that person, that he, it's almost as if it were their own son, right? Their own child with the care and the love that they give him. And so we can have all the religion in the world, but the real test is whether or not it moves us with compassion when someone gets beat up on the side of the road. I think it's also the, the innkeeper's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because the innkeeper, you don't really think much about the other. 
I mean, this is a this kind of got thrown into the whole deal, you know, but I'm thankful that there was no one to do it. And so as we think of this story and we bring it uh, into the world of boys, into the world that we live in, I want to suggest a few things that we can we can glean from the story. And one of those is that people get beat up at really inconvenient times. Right? That, that people get beat up at really inconvenient times. And, 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 uh, and so I, I, it, it's interesting to me that uh, we have to be open to interruption. It seems like that's what God does all through Scripture. When you look at the gospel, and it's story after story of interruption. Have you noticed that? Like, he's on his way somewhere. Someone pulls on his shirt. You know, it's like, I'm going to go to church. We just ran out of wine at our way. You know, I, 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 so it's, it's interruption after interruption, and yet interruptions are the very thing that we carefully work out of our lives so that we have schedules and day timers and everything is so predictable that we don't have time to be interrupted by someone else's pain. It, it also occurs to me that as we think of uh, the real test of our faith, a lot of times we focus on, on some things that are really important, like all of the things that we believe in our theologies. And, and I think there's a lot of sloppy theology out there. I'm, I'm coming up, I, I really uh, think the things that we believe are important. But in the end, the true test of our faith is, is how it works itself out in love and compassion. As James says, true religion is standing for the widow and the orphan. Or as Jesus says so poignantly in Matthew 25, all of us are going to be gathered before God and we're going to be asked a few questions, right? And it's not just going to be a doctrinal test where God asks us about our eschatology, you know, or God asks us who we voted for in the last election, or where we landed on the gay issue, or where we were pre-millennial or post-millennial or no millennial, or whatever. Like, like, that it's not just that. That's what we might wish it was. But actually, I'm just going to ask this when I was in prison. Did you visit me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was If we want to know who the Christians are, we can ask the poor. We can ask those in prison because they will tell us the folks who are living out this compassion. And I, I, it became very clear to me that, uh, especially in recent years, when we have uh, so much talk about justice, and it's so important to talk about justice and, and sex trafficking and the invisible children in Uganda and all this stuff, but I also think that fundamentally, our problem is a relational disconnect, right? It, it's not that uh, that wealthy folks don't care about poor folks. It's that most wealthy folks don't know many poor folks. We don't know where to start. We don't know how to get a bridge into the prison. And yet God is not saying to folks in prison, come find the church. God's saying to us, get into the world, right? Go out, find the ditches, find the alleyways, find those who are broken and beat up on the side of the road. So the last thing that that I think as I look at this scripture is that we need to walk the streets where people get beat up. A friend of mine said, we, we, this story would have never happened if people weren't walking the road to Jericho. And I think that, that for a lot of us, we, we, everything in our culture is teaching us to move away from the streets where people get beat up. But to move out of neighborhoods where there's high crime, where there's people that don't look like them. That's what Paul is built around. Like you move out of those places, and yet the very part of the gospel is that Jesus put skin on and moved into the neighborhood and came from a neighborhood where they said nothing good could come. He endured that suffering with us. And I'm thankful, as one of our friends said, I'm thankful that, that Jesus wasn't too worried about his comfort because he would have never left heaven. You know, that we, we, we see that this story is about a gospel that calls us towards the suffering of the world. So when we orient our lives around Jesus, we have a new orientation about suffering. Right? That, that 
something that I like about something more to try to get away from. It's keeping up on the other side, too, because we want to bear each other's burdens. We want to get into those places where, where people are hurt and abused. And, and so I, I think that's just, uh, it's a very counter-cultural call. And my, my dear friend, Tony Campolo, he always likes to tell the story that if you've heard him preach, you've probably heard him tell it three four times. But it's a great story. He was one of uh, my colleagues, a student at Eastern, was graduating at the top of her class as an education major, and she uh, applied to one of the, the most prestigious suburban schools. There were 300 other people that were, were, you know, rallying for her job, and she came up to Tony and she said, I got it! Out of 300 folks, I got the job at the best high school in Philly. And Tony said, You're one of the best teachers that we have. You should be going to the public schools in this city. We don't have 299 other people lined up to teach there. You know, but I think that's, that's what uh, we've got to be doing, right? Is bearing our young people to connect their gifts to the brokenness of the world that we live in. And that's what Frederick Beacon says so well, right? Is that we take our deepest passion. And we connect them to the world we just came. And I think as we meet people in the ditch, we start to realize that we have something. We have an end, or we have some wine, or we have something that we can do to take care of it. For nothing else, we have time, and we have hands, and we can hold them and help them just come back to life. And I get, I get to see folks all the time that are not just asking about their career, but they're asking about their vocation. Right, because there's been this idea of formation to mission that we that there's uh, I met this one of my friends is a massage therapist. Yeah, I think everybody needs a friend or two massage therapists. Yeah, you know. And uh, she said, you know, and, and, and she said I, I would you know give her massages, folks that have money, and you know, it's, it's not necessarily bad. I got to hang out with folks, and you know, they need to know God's love too. And she says, I also think I've been given these gifts for a reason. And she, she, she went on to say that she met a lot of folks that were women on the avenue. Many of them were victims of sex trafficking. And she said, uh, you know, they don't have a massage therapist, and they could never afford a massage session. And she said, so I had to give them a massage therapist. So she, she opened up a clinic where she invites women in from the avenue, many of them who have lived on the streets and endured all sorts of abuse and pain. And, and she says, every week, get to wash their feet, and I get to give them the best foot massages they could ever imagine, and I get to whisper to them about love. She's a different kind of massage therapist, right? I, I, I met one of, one of my friends who's a, a, a scientist, and like some of the folks we heard earlier, he was deeply uh, troubled by the crisis of a billion people that don't have healthy water, that don't have clean water, and he said, there's a scientist who messed with him, you know, and so I was thinking about that and studying biology and studying technology, and, and uh, then they, they met this uh, group of um, uh, entrepreneurs that are, um, uh, they said, you want to hear something even crazier, um, in industrialized countries, we spend enough money on bottled water that if we just drink hot water and reallocated that money, we could provide water access to the entire world. So they started a bottled water test. It was probably just like years ago. They said, we're going to make some bottled hot water. And you probably should make some bottled hot water. And they sell it, you know. But all the money that they make goes to big wells with indigenous labor. And on every bottle of water, it says, uh, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. You know, and so I'm thankful for the gifts in the kingdom that we have entrepreneurs and massage therapists and scientists. And the question that we have to ask is not just, what am I going to do when I grow up, but who am I becoming? Right? Not just am I going to be a scientist or a lawyer, but what kind of scientist or lawyer are we going to be? How do our gifts connect to the person who grew up in the ditch? And as we think about this scripture, I want to spend the last little bit of our time because I think that there's a, a beautiful piece of this, um, but that there's also a piece of this that uh, Martin Luther King began to see that uh, uh, he used to say, 
that we're called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you also start to ask, maybe we need to transform the whole road to Jericho. And maybe we need to uh, uh, reimagine the road so that people don't keep getting beat up in the ditch. And so I want to invite us to think that just as we respond in compassion out of our faith and our formation, we also are compassionate, our gut reaching agony over the suffering of others also leads us to justice and to ask questions about the fundamental things that land people in the And I am so proud of where we've been able to see the church rise up uh, and, and, and around its, uh, these issues of justice. But I just want to tell you a few stories of how we've seen distinctively safe communities that have uh, a deep commitment to prayer and formation still get out in the streets and, and, and provoke the imagination of the rest of the world as salt and light in the world. So I'm feeling um, And in 50 cities around the United States, there are patterns of anti-homeless legislation, right? Legislation that uh, criminalizes homelessness. Uh, and, and, and these laws range from all sorts of different laws. In Philadelphia, it can be illegal to sleep in any public place. It's illegal to sleep in any of the parks. Uh, and, and one of the final laws in Philly made it illegal to distribute food uh, to homeless folks. In fact, we were fined hundreds of dollars for doing that. And, and as many of you know, if you've read some of my earlier stuff, we got arrested 10 years ago and we fought in court and we won. You know? But those same laws surfaced again in the past uh, two years. And I got to tell you, what was amazing was we already had the pump time. I mean, we were ready, you know. So when they passed an anti-feeding ordinance, it was literally that you couldn't feed more than four people in public. Uh, we rose up, and I mean, we had shirts on that said, um, "If Jesus had done the fish and loaves thing in Philly, he would have done it." Right? And we argued our case. And I got to tell you, it was something beautiful that we were before these public hearings. And we had these amazing testimonials from such a diverse group of people. I mean, we had a Pentecostal woman that said, uh, 15 years ago, God told me to start making fun of And I've been taking them out every week, and uh, I haven't missed a week in 15 years. And if the mayor wants to stop it, then the mayor needs to stop it. Uh, you know, and we had a Catholic theologian, listen to this, right after that, a Catholic theologian argued that when we feed the homeless, we believe it is a sacrament, that we are feeding Jesus. And to say that we cannot feed the homeless is to say that we cannot feed Christ. And we are not willing to come before God. And when God says, when I was hungry, you could feed me, we're not going to say, sorry, God, our mayor wouldn't let us. And uh, that, that Catholic theologian this went all the way to a federal court to get the subpoena of a uh, uh, question of religious freedom. Was it a violation of our religious liberty to feed someone on the street? How beautiful is that? The federal judge says, indeed it is. You cannot say to someone, you cannot feed someone on the street with a violation of your religious freedom. How beautiful, right? And so then, uh, there's all kinds of other things we've got on the council. But my friend in Atlanta, the Atlanta homeless folks were getting arrested for uh, public indecency if they were using the restroom in a, in a park or in an alleyway. There's no public restrooms, and so they had a whole campaign, pee for free with dignity. And then uh, <laughs> they marched to the mayor's office with toilets, and now it's part of why Atlanta has public restrooms. And so you look at that, and you just, and many of these are people of deep faith that see that our faith calls us to compassion and justice. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen is this idea of hospitality, welcoming the stranger, which also raises questions right about immigration. And as, as Scripture says, you know, when we welcome the foreigner, we welcome them as if they were our own flesh and blood. And so Philadelphia has a whole movement of churches that are committed to hospitality called the New Sanctuary Movement. And there's also a hospitality network of churches in all over the U.S. that open their buildings to homeless. Families, right? They can live in the long run of that in Tennessee. But it's really, but one of the other things that began to happen is the city. You know, yeah, I love the city. 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 I love the
I was still working on it. So as a student came in and they called this church, again, it was a Pentecostal church, and they said, you cannot run a shelter. You don't have all the permits, and, and you know, there's a lot of regulations, and you know, you, you can't run a shelter. And they were like, we're going to pray about this. And uh, they, they met again in a week, and they said, we prayed about it, and we want you to know that we respect you. You know, and, and they said, so we've heard you say we can't run a shelter, so we're not going to run a shelter, but we are going to run a church. And, and, the, and what the church does is we welcome people. Like, like that, that's the fundamental call of our faith. And they said, so we're just going to call them with the And it's going to happen every night at about 8 o'clock. We're going to start the revival, and it's going to go to the next morning about 9 or 10 o'clock, Lord willing. And you're welcome. Anybody's welcome to the revival. And uh, I went up one night. The news tried to cover it, right? Like, literally, it was one of the front stories. And so they're like, uh, the person just said about that they are no longer running a shelter, they having a revival. Thank you. You know, and uh, like, so that was amazing. We went one night, and I mean, it was packed with folks that would undoubtedly be on the street, and, and, uh, and they shared their stories. We sang the words of songs, it was beautiful. And then, uh, Includes our formal revival service. The next eight hours or so will be silent meditation. Everybody have a good night. An evening of contemplative prayer is a revival. And not yet, as far as I know, that revival still going. And I, I think of another community that I met along the border of the U.S. and Mexico, and they became very concerned about the, the way that we're dealing with the children and the border issues. And uh, and, and so they said, we're not going to wait for politicians in Washington to tell us how to treat the immigrant or the stranger. We will look to Christ and we will look to Scripture. And so they started these worship services. I, I love it. And they have a whole group of hospitality houses of Christians there. But they also started these worship services because they said, we need to bear witness of a God of We're organizing worship services along the wall, right? And uh, the, the folks in Mexico would meet at the wall, and folks on the U.S. side would meet on the other side, and they would sing each other hymns over the wall, and then they would serve each other communion. And so one time they threw the bread over the wall, and they said, as we did it, we were reminded that we have a God whose love does not stop at borders. Identity redefines us that we are born again, and what's born of the flesh is flesh, but we are born again in the very Spirit of God, which means this other person on the other side of some wall is as precious as if they were my own flesh and blood. And it's that imagination that we can have to break out of our liturgy, right? That we have to perform it on the streets, we have to get out of our buildings, we've got to get into the world that we live in. And Questions about some of these issues of justice. I think it's a damn for me. I walk in the streets where people get beat up. You know, I, you know I, I saw things I never saw growing up in East Tennessee. And I love East Tennessee. And I, I also grew up with a, 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 a feeling like a lot of the world was pretty together. And then I began to see racism and injustice. I began to see kids getting we have almost one homicide a day. And I remember when one of those bullets went off and I came outside and on my front steps, this young 19 year old man in black. I held his hand and he said, There's a man who wants to ride the next morning. He found out that he had died. And so we're constantly going for those people. Teaching non violence, teaching Teaching prayer, teaching discipline, of, you know, uh, uh, keeping our self control and check the fruits of the spirit. We have them painted on our murals. You know, like it's, it's in us. And yet we also start to say after we lift so many people off the street, where are they getting the guns? Right? We, we start to say there's also bigger structures that are at place here. And we begin to look at a study that shows. 
that there are several gun shops that are notorious for dealing illegal guns and for trafficking them in the streets. And so we began prayer vigils on the side of those gun shops. And it's some of the most powerful things I've seen in my life. I, 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 one, one of those services, we have uh, pastors from all denominations that kneel down in front of the gun shop and they were arrested for illegal you know, in the uh, spirit of the civil rights, they went to jail. But what happened was, as they went to jail, it was a showcase trial. And uh, uh, what happened was they put the gun shop on trial. This is what Martin Luther King said. Uh, we expose injustice so that it becomes so uncomfortable that people have to respond. Right? And so that's what happened. Like, people begin to see this gun shop. And uh, the judge thankfully found all the defendants not guilty. And in the, in the later days, the gun shop owner was found guilty of trafficking illegal guns. His license was revoked and his gun shop was shut down. And I don't say that triumphal but the lament is the hoping that uh, he can find his location, right? That we can do better as we re- reimagine God's dream in our neighborhood. But one of the most powerful services that we had was on Good Friday. We gathered outside of the gun shop uh, right near our block. Uh, and uh, we, young men in my neighborhood, many of them who have seen their, their friends killed, they carried the cross. And they carried it on Good Friday in the front of the gun shop. And they laid it in. And we had this powerful service where we, we read the passion of Jesus, the violence that he endured. We heard about the women weeping at the foot of the cross. But then we also connected Good Friday to our streets. And we heard the mothers cry out about losing their kids to gun violence in Philadelphia. And, uh, and then we heard some good preaching. You know, we, we, had point. we even had a rabbi that came to us. I don't do a lot of Good Friday services, uh, but this is wonderful. And, uh, and we... And we had a uh, we had uh, a Pentecostal pastor that said it might be Friday, but Sunday's coming, right? Like in the end, we know the tomb is empty, and the mother said, "Amen." You know, and we 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 we, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus, but we also remembered that that redefines everything, right? That it redefines the, how we live in these broken streets. And so afterwards, this mother was just weeping. Shovel and a race, right? 
And there was, we started getting pictures from all over the world of folks that were inspired by the same scripture and taking guns and making guitars. You know, another guy had uh, made uh, from Mozambique was taking a gun and made a saxophone that he played music on. And then we got this image from Iran. It's from here. Running over, smashing the guns in Iraq. How beautiful this image, right? And, and, uh, and so we also, our, our latest weapons conversion that we did, is, we said, you know, most of the, the violence is really from Philadelphia. And so again, we made a call for guns and we got some handguns in Philadelphia. And this time we prayed about it. And we really felt we wanted to do something a little different. So we took the gun and we heated it up, red hot, and so on. But then we invited the mother. We lost her children. And this woman, you can see a picture of her son on her desk here. And she took that hand and she started beating on that gun. This woman was tossed into the machine gun. And she started beating on that gun with every foot of her hand. And she said, Yes, yes, oh, my boy. Uh, 
Again, there was, you know, but so you just whip the eyes a little God stuff. Everybody eats the baskets left over. But what I love about the story that we often miss is that little kid got to be a part of the story. That the disciples got to be a part of the story and the miracle. That for some strange reason, God doesn't want to change the world for them. And if we go on a hand with the God, and we say, I you a to the Lord to and the Lord to 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 the Lord you are my body, but you are my hands and my feet. And so if we ask God to move a mountain, God might give us a trouble. Can I get away from this? And I think that this is a divine conspiracy of God collaborating with God to bring God's kingdom on earth. And we do that with our words, but we also do it with our lives and with our public witness as community. Otherwise, we will be nothing more than a human being. The Christians can be the disciples of the church because we have so much to 